Okay, welcome and thank you for joining us for today's event, Remodeling, a discussion on disruption and adaptation in real estate. My name is Gabe Bolio and I'm a member of the Career Programs team here in the Office of Alumni Relations. Today's webinar is sponsored by the Boston University Alumni Association and is offered to our 339,000 alumni around the globe. Before we begin, I'd like to welcome the many members of the BU community who are joining us today from all over the world, from places like Argentina, Spain, Pakistan, to Studio City, Berkeley, and Modesto, California, Portland, Oregon, Phoenix, Arizona, Austin, Texas, Asheville, North Carolina, and spots like Lancaster, Yardley, and Philly, PA, Potomac, Maryland, Westport, Connecticut, West Orange, New Jersey, and across New York State in places like Pittsburgh, Roslyn, Bethpage, Great Neck, and of course, BK in Manhattan. And hello to our listeners in BU's own backyard who are tuning in from spots like Braintree, Cambridge, Grafton, Marblehead, Newton Center, Stoughton, Sudbury, Wellesley, and Winchester. We are glad to welcome you all here today. Today's presentation is being recorded and will soon be available for on-demand viewing on the Alumni Association website. If you have questions for our speakers today, you can submit them throughout the presentation by typing them into the Q&A box. To find the Q&A box, mouse over your Zoom screen to reveal the toolbar at the bottom, then select Q&A. It is now my pleasure to introduce our moderator for today's program, Jimmy Kuhn. Mr. Kuhn is President and Head of Investor Services at Newmark Knight Frank in New York. Before coming to Newmark, he spent 15 years as owner manager with his late partner, Bernard Mendick, where he acquired 11 million square feet of office space and 6,000 apartments. The company was sold to Vernado in 1997. He and Barry Gosen then built Newmark and sold it to Cantor in 2011, and the company went public in 2018. Mr. Kuhn now runs all investor services from capital markets, investment sales, and landlord representation. Mr. Kuhn has also been a champion of education, endowing several programs, such as the Real Estate Center at the Whitman School of Management at Syracuse University, and the James and Marjorie Kuhn Program to foster diversity in real estate at the NYU Schacht Institute, <coughs> as well as funding fencing programs to both Stuyvesant High School and for underprivileged children for the San Antonio Fencing Club. Mr. Kuhn holds both a BBA in finance and an MBA in real estate from Syracuse University, and I'm told is an excellent fencer. Jimmy, thank you so much for being here today, and now I turn the floor over to you. Do I have to, uh, oh, there we go. Thank you, Gabe. So I feel a little bit like the emergency goaltender who sits in the stands, minding his own business, and all of a sudden two goaltenders goal get hurt and he's rushed onto the ice. And so uh, this, this happened to me yesterday. Michael Lippolito, my partner, um, called me and said, can you step in? So here I am, I hope I don't screw it up. Um, but I thought I would give you sort of my take on, on, the, on the real estate climate as we know it today. And if you think back to March, early March, when things were normal, um, the sectors that were really strong were the industrial sector because of um, stay at home and last mile delivery and uh, the data center business because of the cloud and AI and the life science business because of what's going on in the, in the, in the pharmaceutical world and the genome um, and cell towers, of course. And, and the multifamily business was pretty good too. The two sectors that weren't so good with the retail sector, obviously from the competition of Amazon and many online at home uh, sales, um, and the hotel business because there were just too many damn hotels. Well, guess what? We went into this pandemic and as you can imagine, which real estate is the trailing indicator, the stock market's the leading indicator. So the, all the REITs sort of took a dive, but those sectors that were strong took a lesser dive and those sectors that weren't strong got crushed. Um, the office building is the middle ground where nobody can really figure out what's going to win out. Dedensification that the corporations will need more space or in fact remote working from home will be less space. Um, everybody's expect expecting a lot of distress. We haven't seen it yet. The non-performing loan market hasn't emerged yet, but that'll take time and probably as you heard from the Fed chairman yesterday, expects to be a long recovery. and That's why the market's down 1200 today. So at this point, I think I will turn it over to our panelists and ask each of them the question. We have Sean Kelly Rand uh, from RD Advisors, Lauren Jesnecki from Bazudo in Boston, and, and Matt Kahn 
uh, from the Olean group. So let me start with Kelly, with uh, Sean Kelly Rand, and ask you, what were you doing March 1st in terms of st strategic investing, and how has that changed, and how will it change going forward? Sure. So RD Advisors is a bridge lender. Um, we have our own balance sheet, and then we partner up with credit funds and hedge funds to lend on effectively non-bank lending in the real estate sector. Um, on March 1st, we were you know, starting off our kind of our Q1 and, and looking forward, we were lining up lines of credit, additional capital partners, and we were looking at an environment with effectively falling rates. So you know, we were chasing rates down and, and compensating that by finding cheaper lines of credit on, on ourselves. What happened in the meantime? So on that same time, we were looking to secure our balance sheet. I personally had, had come out of Lehman in, in 08 um, and had seen kind of a, a liquidity crisis firsthand at that time. And we quickly shifted gears mid-March when we saw this happening and effectively early signs of liquidity drying up, focused first on our own balance sheet. We were about to pay down some loans on some um, lines of credit. We, we held on to those, we kept liquidity, we paid a little bit extra. And then we started looking for, you know, shortly thereafter coming out of it, looking now that we had some liquidity uh, on our competitive environment. What we found was a lot of our you know, peers in the industry were highly levered and had their lines of credit pulled and were unable to, to finance and had started looking for liquidity in other places, including selling loan pools. So we shifted our business to focus more, um, at least in the short term, in trying to acquire some loan pools and potentially some NPL pools. But as you say, I think that's further along down the line. So, so Lauren, you're in, the, you're in the business of developing residential real estate. So you face two issues in a great multifamily market all of a sudden, A, who's going to pay their rents in April and in May? And number two, how many jobs under construction were stopped cold? And what do your lenders say? So why don't you give us a sense of you know, how your business was before and, and, and how it is now? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you to BU for having me. I'm so pleased to be here. I'm a senior vice president with uh, Pazuta Development Company. And as you said, Jimmy, we focus on the multifamily world. Um, and as of March 1st, things were moving ahead. We had a couple projects that were um, moving towards a closing and one that was under construction. Um, as a result of the pandemic, luckily our uh, project under construction was only closed for a day or two, really very limited downtime. Um, but certainly had upgraded measures to make sure the safe the site was safe and um, everything temperature checks to hand washing and sanitation measures. Um, the projects under uh, getting ready for closing were delayed and, and um, we've really just pushed the timelines out a few months. One was looking for equity, one's looking was looking for debt. In the long term, we don't think there are concerns. We think um, like most urban areas, this has really accelerated some trends that were already coming. Um, and so we've been really just sort of um, keeping our ear to the ground, trying to understand where rents might, grow, might go. But in general, um, our rent collections have been quite strong. So across uh, Pazuto's nearly 80,000 unit portfolio, we saw rent collections in April down a few points, uh, but May was better than April. And June is looking like it's going to be better than May. Um, as it relates to last year's uh, rent collections. So I, I think across the board, we're feeling optimistic and hopeful, um, but certainly watching the trends and eager to see what the new normal looks like um, here in a, in a few months. So Matt, if I can call you Matt, um, you know, when you think about, you're investing in all property types. And, you know, when I ask investors, you know, what they look for today, the first thing they say is they want to invest in innovation cities where the talent is, um, they want to invest some of them in, in high growth, low, stat, low tax states, but some of them also say I'd rather invest in supply constrained markets, gateway cities. Um, I don't know how much that thinking has changed for you, but tell me about your portfolio before and has it changed your thinking? Sure. So thank you, Jimmy, for, uh, for stepping in to moderate today. I uh, appreciate that. And thank you as well to BU for, uh, for hosting the webinar. I appreciate that as well. So, um, so, I'm Matt Kahn, the director of real estate for the Oleon Group. For those who uh, don't know, Oleon is a, a private global enterprise with a, a diverse investment platform ranging from real estate to public and private equity. Uh, I oversee the uh, existing portfolio of commercial, residential, and mixed-use assets for Oleon, as well as spearheading uh, new investments for the firm uh, across the U.S. and the Americas. 
So, um, you know, in terms of, of before, call it, you know, February, uh, early March versus now, a lot's happened obviously in 90 days and, and the world is changing still every week. Um, you know, uh, going into this crisis, we were, you know, we invest in a, in a wide array of assets, everything from multifamily to office to retail, some hospitality, uh, industrial, uh, senior housing, uh, all across the US and across the globe. And we actually still, you know, multifamily, just like, uh, just like Lauren, we were holding our breath a little bit in April and May, uh, trying to figure out where the collections were going to come in. They came in very strong, on par, basically, with where, with where we were uh, pre-COVID. And, uh, you know, that thesis for Class B workforce housing across the U.S., we find to be uh, recession resilient. And that, sort of, that, that thesis has held up throughout this process. And, uh, you know, we, we still think that that looking forward is going to be a strong place uh, to make investments. Um, we own about 22,000 uh, Class B multifamily across the country. Great. Um, so let's talk a little bit about retail because it, you're all impacted indirectly or directly. Um, as you know, Simon uh, decided he wasn't going to close on the Talbot portfolio. At least that's what he states at the moment, $3.6 billion transaction. Um, and everybody thought he would. And of course, we know how bad retail is, but, it, but it's not going away. It's just getting harder and harder to compete with the online uh, sales. So um, I guess I would ask each of you, um, you know, Matt, because you invest in it, Sean, because you finance it, and Lauren, because you might have some retail in your multifamily developments, you know, how you think retail uh, impacts what you do and what you will do going forward. I'll start with Sean. Yeah, I mean, I think it's hard to finance anything in the retail sector now. I mean, I think if you're looking at a lender's perspective, we don't get a pop if things do well, right? We get our money back and some interest. We don't. So why bother take the risk? Um, you know, I think we'll look at it very, very selectively. I think a lot of retail things are actually are, you know, depends on the retail, but some of it is just effectively land. Um, you know, developable lands. Are you going to see strip malls now that guys are looking to acquire? Um, from birth to multifamily. So, so Lauren, you either have retail in your projects, or you need to have retail in the community, or, the, or your 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 residents aren't really going to move there if they can't go to the grocery store or or, yep. or shop at the drugs pharmacy. So, what's your sense of retail? Yeah. So, generally, and you know, pre the break, we always thought of retail as an amenity, as a um, really a placemaker, as you know, bringing great energy and, and services to our communities. It was never often driving the rent. As you mentioned, it's always been on the ground floor and um, more of an, an activation component. And then, and so, um, and then of course, most jurisdictions require it. They want the street to be enlivened. They want, you know, an urban um, experience. So we have to put it in um, oftentimes. It's going to be a challenge and the project that's under construction now I had mentioned um, has two ground floor retail spaces. We already have an urban target that's been signed up and is still planning to go in. Um, but two smaller retail spaces, one intended to be a restaurant. And at the moment, um, we're trying to figure out ways to activate that space when the building delivers and the, the retail will likely be vacant. And so working with our management team to figure out, could it be a co-working space, like, um, you know, sort of bare bones, and but fit out with tables and um, printers and, and the ability for um, connectivity just in the interim. I think long-term, we think retail will be successful here and in, and in most of the locations that we're um, have ground floor retail, but as this has shown, um, the downturn, I think we did have a lot of retail, probably too much, and there will be a little bit of a correction. Um, and again, we're just trying to come up with creative ways to activate that space if we have, if we had to put it in, um, or if it's already in and it's empty. So, so Matt, I don't know how much retail you have in the portfolio, um, but how's retail uh, impacted uh, you, your existing portfolio, if at all? Yeah, I mean, our exposure to retail uh, specifically is is fairly small, um, you know, but uh, and, and it's diverse across the across the globe. But, you know, I think that with retail, not all retail is is created e equally. Uh, obviously, coming into COVID, we saw a tiering uh, in the space. Um, you know, obviously, there's your high street retail, experiential retail, convenience retail, and, and then commoditized retail, sort of everything in between. And what we were seeing coming into this was that experiential or that commoditized retail was, was giving way towards experiential retail. 
um, you know, the experience uh, of going somewhere, doing something is sort of very much in line with the social media aspect of, of the, the world we were kind of coming into. And that was doing very well from what we saw. Um, you know, a lot of this commoditized sort of mall retail, to your point about Simon and, and Taubman, you know, those are great operators. Um, but, uh, you know, but, but what we saw was um, that uh, that experiential retail uh, now more so than ever is going to be important coming out of this. Um, you know, I think that the high street retail, you know, really relied a lot upon um, uh, foreign uh, in, uh, investors, uh, tourists coming in, um, you know, really, really traveling and, and visiting those places, especially in New York City. And I think part of the question is how long this sort of uh, this carries on and uh, sort of this, this mitigated travel, what that does long term to impacts to high street retail and, and luxury uh, retailers. Restaurants, obviously, uh, you know, how we, how we manage uh, and how they operate. Social distancing, it's going to be challenging. You know, New York City has done a lot of good studies and research around how to sort of uh, reopen, um, trying to accentuate and utilize outdoor space, um, you know, to try and, and, and bring people back. So, you know, I think it's going to be a, a changing world, how we do leases, handle leases, handle retail. Um, it's going to be probably tough for a little while, but, uh, but I think long term again it's it's being in, in the best corners the best locations and i think that long term we should be fine so the, the the title of this panel was really going to be disruption adaptation i would i would add a word in between and i would say opportunity so i guess my question for the three of you is um what do you think the first asset that you will uh buy or finance um coming out of this now it could be a week from now you could tell me it's a month from now it could be six months from now but let's start with you Matthew where are we coming out of this three six well if you, if you had to pick an opportunity where do you think that opportunity would be for you so look I, I think the overarching question here is th there's been a lot thrown out about uh, what are the, sh the short-term and long-term impacts of this um, obviously, short term, we're already seeing them, you know, what, what uh, limited travel has done to hospitality and retail, as you mentioned. Uh, long term, you know, in the office space, the question is, you know, are, are tenants going to sort of de-urbanize, move more towards suburban areas? Are they going to want to stay in, in urban areas? Um, there's a huge urban, urbanization trend happening coming into to the crisis. Um, are they going to need more space? Uh, to, to allow for more distance within the space itself. Um, you know, I think that long term, um, my view is that, uh, you know, this is like everything else, every other shock we've seen in, in previous cycles, uh, there is a period of time which this is top of mind for everybody. And, you know, it could be until there's a vaccine, maybe sometime shortly thereafter, but that at some point this will be in the rear view. And the trends that we saw coming into this will likely uh, fall back into place for all the reasons that we saw is you know, limited real estate, right? And so, and so people needed to densify, um, you know, and as long as the cities come out of this uh, as strong as they were uh, coming into it, I think people will still want to be in the cities. And so I think ultimately, you know, you have to look at it from those short and long-term trends and, and what your viewpoint is. I think specifically asset class wise, you know, I'd, I'd say one asset class is it's interesting, and I'm curious as to how it's going to play out, is the senior housing space. We do have some senior housing investment, but uh, it's a very small part of our portfolio. And obviously, uh, that demographic has been hit hardest uh, by COVID. And as a result, the senior housing facilities have been hit very hard, very tragically. And so part of the question is, in the short term, will that create some dislocation and distress, uh, people pulling family members out of, out of these uh, facilities? Um, maybe a, 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 a refocus on the space itself. But long term, I think a lot of those demographic trends, the aging population that we have here in the US probably still hold true. And so maybe there's a short term dislocation, which, which makes way for a long term opportunity. Uh, it's, it's an area that we're, you know, we're exploring. So, so Lauren, multifamily development, um, there's a lot of sectors, right? Your conventional garden multifamily, there's a high rise, there's student housing, there's senior housing, affordable housing, manufactured housing. Um, and you build a lot, you develop a lot, but do you get to a point, do you think in this kind of environment where it's cheaper to buy existing assets below replacement cost, or do you see multifamily being too strong and you'll continue to build ground up? 
So we, um, being on the development team, we're just focused on the ground up work, but, um, but don't see that um, subsiding. I mean, even with what we've seen as um, equity and debt has pulled back a little bit, sort of this wait and see what happens as the downturn um, continues. Being in Boston, being in these core markets, Washington, D.C., we're in Philadelphia as well. Um, again, the long-term trends, I think, are still really strong. Being in Boston, we're looking at the healthcare sector um, and all the opportunity that's there. Um, so building housing proximate to Cambridge, Somerville, North Alston. Um, we're also just you know, incredibly bullish that a lot of these markets are still underhoused. And so Boston and the state of Massachusetts still need tens of thousands of housing units um, across the Commonwealth. And, and so as much as we can build in good locations, close to transit, um, in urban cores, or in the sort of more um, inner suburbs, um, we still think there's a ton of opportunity. Um, we're looking at, at the downturn from um, sort of this new normal, because while I, I agree with Matt that people have short memories and that people will eventually go back to normal, you know, things will go back to a new normal, um, this, the, the trend of pandemics may be more frequent, frequent right? The, um, the sort of globalization of the world and, and travel and whatnot. So we're thinking of ways to redesign our buildings so that they are a little bit more health conscious, that um, things are more touchless, things are more frictionless, that there's um, just an, an overall approach that would allow for a flexibility should this happen again. Um, our management colleagues have picked up on virtual leasing virt virtually overnight. They, they went from fully staffed leasing offices with three or four leasing agents to doing everything digitally. Um, and it's been a huge success. So I think those things will remain. It'll make our operations more efficient. And then we're just thinking of how to redesign or reposition some of our buildings to, again, um, allow for a situation like this, you know, which may be sooner than we might expect. So Sean, um, the first thing I remembered in, in late March was that the mortgage rates went into the tank. They were very highly leveraged. Uh, a lot of them had big hotel and retail exposure and um, a bunch of them had to get bailed out. Um, and a lot of that was mezzanine financing. And, and I wonder if you're a bridge lender in this kind of market, um, I would guess just by implication, the gap between um, the, the the value and the and the debt has compressed, and and the bridge loans I would get would be impacted. So, um, tell me about how your your portfolio of of loans and maybe bridge loans, especially or mes loans, you know, how's it been impacted, and are you worried? Did we lose the voice? Sorry, uh, we we don't do mes lending for exactly that same point. So I, I think there may be, you know one MES loan, or there may be points where we're cross collateralized or we've taken share security in addition to senior loans, but almost everything we do um, in the, the grand scheme of it is, is senior lending. So, you know, one of the things I saw in the last crisis in, in, in 08 was how quickly the MES lenders were squeezed. The equity had control and the senior had the, the best position in the capital stack. And the MES lender, unless they could buy out the senior, was you know kind of out of pocket pretty quick. And so we've taken those lessons on board, uh, you know, hard and fast. Anything that we did do, that if it was MES, it was either again cross collateralized with it, or it would have been something that was extremely low LTV to begin with. And I think I actually see that as an opportunity going forward. And I don't know if it's an opportunity for us or other lenders out in the space, but what we're seeing is first liquidity crisis, right? And then we're seeing on the sense is the delay. Um, a lot of uh, condo developers, um, you know, especially in that space, they were already getting delayed. I think we were already predicting there might be a recession. I think the prices have held up and I think the residential sales have held up, but I think as things have gotten delayed, some of the developers themselves have had liquidity issues and needed capital injected into their developments. And I think there's some pretty hefty premiums that, you know, MES lenders willing to take on construction risk um, can earn um, for, for a relatively, you know, short-term position. So, and, and I'm not sure that yet that, that we're willing to dip in there, but I do see it as a huge opportunity for guys out there that are. So Matt, are you, are you geography uh, um, driven? In other words, when you, are you looking for, you know, best deal anywhere on the planet or are you looking at um, Southeast, Southwest? You're looking at 
you know, urban downtown. Uh, maybe your view has changed. Maybe you're worried about cities like New York, maybe Boston, maybe Chicago, San Francisco that have transportation systems that require, um, you know, uh, employees to go to work that way. Um, what do you think about geographies when you think about investing today? Yeah, I mean, it really depends on, on asset class. Uh, you know, for instance, uh, life sciences as an asset class, uh, you know, the tier one cities there, you know, might look very different than or very specific relative to other tier one cities. Uh, you know, Boston, obviously, uh, San Diego, San Francisco uh, come to mind there. I think generally speaking, you know, we're looking if it's if it's going to be urban opportunities, we're looking to be in, in tier one cities generally, um, you know, New York. Uh, Boston, LA, San Francisco, that's where we would focus. Um, you know, on the Class B uh, multifamily workforce housing side, you know, those are just opportunities in, in good submarkets all across the U.S. You know, we, we sort of have a foothold, uh, you know, everywhere across, across the U.S., uh, uh, Southeast, Northeast, Mid-Atlantic, out West. So, um, you know, it really is about the, the, the asset itself um, and just good fundamentals. Um, you know, I think that going forward, uh, I don't know that that thesis really will change all that much. I think probably one thing that I would say uh, is, you know, if there is clearly, we've seen over the last 90 days, there's been this push towards the suburbs and specifically around New York, there's been, you know, some articles written about a lot of demand about, uh, Manhattanites looking to go out to New Jersey and Connecticut and Westchester and, you know, they want space because they're going to be working from home, maybe you know, for the time being or, or you know, longer term, you know, part time, whatever. Um, and so sort of as a, as a hedge, one idea is, you know, to actually Lauren's point, you know, transit oriented development was a, was a big, uh, uh, you know, idea and push over the last 10 years, um, you know, being close to good urban areas. But I think that even it probably uh, exacerbates the, the desire to go towards TOD good suburban areas now surrounded by good cities or central to good cities because you get to sort of hedge your bet, right? Whether or not this is a short-term or long-term trend, sort of exurb and move to, move to the suburbs, you know, you get to be in, in a location that has good or, you know, suburban uh, fundamentals um, and good surrounding towns, uh, but on a train line where, you know, as this, you know, gets to be more and more behind us and, and as things get back to, to normal, um, you, know, you still have that exposure exposure to, you know, towards good commuting, uh, commutability back into the cities. So, so I think that, you know, transit oriented now more than ever probably makes a lot of sense to sort of hedge bets, both short and long term. So, so Lauren, what are you hearing from your tenants? Do they, do they want bigger units, smaller units? Can they pay their rent? Can they not pay their rent? Um, mm -hmm. Do they want a different type of air filtration system to feel safer? Do they want, um, if you have high rise, do they, do they want uh, voice activated elevator buttons. What, what are you What are you hearing from your tenants? Yeah, and how has so it changed the philosophy going forward? It's um, It's happening real time. So our uh, management colleagues are actively starting to reopen amenity spaces and um, truly, like you know, operate these buildings under a, in a COVID world. Um, so it, it's all real time. But certainly, a lot of the things you mentioned, all you know, hands free, um, voice activated. Hands, you know, sanitize, so cleanliness is going up. Um, we already do a lot of really great, you know, it's sort of a moment to reflect as we think back on what we do as a, as a development company and our design standards to then what we might do going forward. We already did a lot of having great light and air. 70% um, of our apartments on average have outdoor space, some sort of a balcony or a terrace. Um, we bring in um, a lot of natural elements plants and um, you know from an air purification standpoint we change our filters four times a year I mean these are all things I'm I'm actually we're diving into the weeds and learning more now what our operations team has been doing all along which are it's incredible um, and that's been giving our tenants a ton of comfort so I think it's really dialing up some of the things that we were already doing um, making again this frictionless experience so folks can literally like you know everything from registering to tour an apartment to actually touring the space to then um, coming and, and you know interfacing with the building as, as part of their move-in. That that's all going virtually now. It's all happening virtually now. Um, and just this idea of really um, you know, creating a, a very seamless experience for the residents. So 
we're doing a lot of it. I think we're just doing it more now and probably more intentionally. Um, in the near term, as the pandemic was is you know now you know still very active, we've just um, diminished the capacity of our amenities. So taken out every other chair, um, you know, allow people to book the fitness center for certain amounts of time so there's not overcrowding. Um, having a lot of having more like stations for packages to be delivered and meals to be delivered so there aren't delivery folks running through the building, um, you know, again, potentially trying to limit the number of people coming into each building. So that, those are some of the immediate things that we did. Um, but then, like I mentioned, you know, some of these long-term things that we were already doing, we're just doing it to a larger extent um, and a little bit more strategically with this pandemic in mind. So um, I'm obviously older than all of you, and I've been through a number of these, the, the early 80s, the early 90s, 2008, 2009. And in every one of these sort of financial um, recessionary type events, I feel the deck gets restacked and leverage, legacy leverage maybe goes away. I know in, in a lot of the startups in America have come out of these recessions, people are laid off, they have to figure out what to do. But I'm asking a different question of all of you, and that is for, for the students that are coming out or, or the young people in our business, it's an opportunity for them to reinvent themselves and also to maybe bring a new fresh look at, at what's going on in the world. And I, I wondered what advice you would give for, for young, either students or young people in the business on what they should be doing in this time and, and where should they be looking and what opportunities you think there are for young people in our business? I'll start with you, Sean. Um, I think, I mean, part of it is going back to, you know, part of it is social media, some of it is the digitalization. Um, a, a lot of these things that are coming out that, you know, I probably look younger than I am, but, you know, 2001, when I graduated, I don't think it was such a big deal. It wasn't necessarily, I got my first cell phone while I was in college because I kept missing, um, you know, interviews or potential interviews because I didn't, you know, they couldn't reach me at home. Um, and I think now it's a whole different generation. And I think just having that and infusing that in our business, right? And so what does, you know, what are the employees that are coming in? How do they contribute in ways? And, and you know, our interns that have come straight out of BU um, in the past, one of the great ways they've contributed is, hey, well, you know, I understand social media way better than, you know, I'm ever going to understand it. How do we infuse that into your business? How do you think about that? Um, how do we think about technology? How do we think about marketing our business? Um, and, and then how do those things impact the, you know, our clients? So, you know, how is, the, how are the new technologies and how are the, the new way of doing things, how are they impacting our clients on the residential side, on the retail side, or, you know, is that next generation going to want to go into retail? What store are they, do they need to go into? Um, how are they finding it? So I, so I think people shouldn't underestimate the value they bring, even as the youngest person on the team, they don't have the experience that I have or you have on the debt capital markets or the real estate capital markets, but they bring a different expertise in that, that, that I couldn't possibly have not growing up with it. Lauren, same question. Yeah, I was just going to say, I think it's, um, especially for folks, students just graduating now, um, being part of the Gen Z cohort, I mean, that is going to shape the world. They're going to shape the world, right? As, as one of the largest generations um, we've seen. And I think um, coming on the heels of the millennials, so to really be reflective and to say, you know, as I launch into the real estate world, what do I want to see? What, what kind of apartments do I want to live in? Um, what does an office space look like that I'd want to go to every day? And um, talk to friends, you know, talk to, um, to folks that they're close to, because I think that's what we're trying to do is we're trying to understand, you know, what do they want as they start to age into apartment renting? Um, in some of these urban areas. So um, I think it's a neat time, especially for, for folks in that generation to start to tell us what they want so we can start building it. So, so Matt, I, I, I know that I always tell young students, you know, if you can't do an Excel spreadsheet and you can't run Argus, you're kind of limiting the opportunities. And I, I wondered if you feel that's important or, or is it more just somebody with a wide vision of, of what comes next? Yeah, you must be reading my mind uh, a bit. So, you know, I, I came up um, in the real estate world really through uh, the finance side of it. Um, you know, as you said, uh, really uh, analyzing, understanding the underlying uh, development projects uh, and really telling that story through financials, you know, via Excel. You know, I'll get to the tech side in a moment because I do want to uh, echo Lauren and Sean's thoughts there and, and expound that for a moment. 
But, um, you know, on, on the fundamental side, I think that one of the critical things, no matter, you know, where we are in a cycle, no matter what the trends are, short and long term, uh, at the end of the day, these are investments, right? These are things that rely upon fundamentals. And so understanding those fundamentals by way of the, the financials is always critical. And it's always going to be the thing that no matter what gimmicks or tricks, uh, you know, we want to we wanna put onto things, how we want to develop different, different assets, ultimately it comes back to the numbers and it comes back to what's my rate of return and, uh, and the fundamentals around a deal. So I, I would say that, you know, there's never uh, too little you can do to sharpen your skill set when it comes to understanding the fundamentals uh, of a deal, of an asset class, um, and, and you know, lending a hand that way to, to whatever company you're working for. So I would strongly recommend really understanding that, that piece of, you know, of the business. On the tech side, um, you know, definitely echo Lauren and, and Sean's sentiments. You know, th this uh, next generation coming up is gonna be the most tech savvy. We're also now, I, I keep hearing this phrase that, you know, obviously, Tech is changing constantly, but this uh, the last 90 days we've accelerated our uh, our, our tech uh, savvy and, and, and tech usage by a decade in the last 90 days, and uh, work from home and everything else. So, you know, I think that uh, that is going to continue to shape the real estate industry, and, and real estate as an industry has has really been one of the slowest adopters of technology, um, although it's getting there. You know, things like prop tech. Our, our new buzzwords over the last you know, 12, 24 months. So I think that if you, if you start by thinking through what are the, the problems you can solve? How do you make something better for tenants or landlords or any stakeholder in the business? If you start with that question uh, and you follow that thought through to try and use uh, this ever-growing technology to try and solve that question um, or improve upon it, I think that you know, with the, the youngest uh, folks in the audience who have that, you know, that utmost savvy to be able to, to help in that regard and, and, and focus attention there, I think too, would also be very helpful. So, so um, when you think about the 43 million unemployed people in the country after yesterday, um, and you think about your industry and you try to project, you know, how that's going to impact us. Um, clearly we're in a recession. The Fed chairman yesterday said it's going to be a while to come out of it. Um, how can you look longer term in your business when you have a cost of capital issue, right? So you, if you have investors and they want to earn an internal rate of return, whether it's core, core plus, value add, opportunistic, um, how do you underwrite deals for the next two or three years when you just don't know because of this huge unemployment and the, and the, the events of COVID and, and whether we'll get a vaccine in the fall or next quarter, um, uh, hopefully, you know, an eight and a half minute video woke up the country and we will fix the diversity issue we have in this country, which is, which is, you know, for another subject. But, you know, you have to think about real estate underwriting and, and, and how you look at real estate. Um, and can you look at three years out or do you not have time to do that? Lauren, I'll start with you. Yeah, um, so what we're assuming now is that rents, because they haven't really um, been too soft, I mentioned, you know, our collections have been relatively strong. So across the portfolio, we're not assuming a lot of rent, um, you know, decrease at the moment, but we are assuming that there'll be a slower um, escalation. So probably no escalation for the next year and maybe moderate escalation um, for the year after that. Um, that's as far as we've gotten in our crystal ball. Um, but, but yeah, so, so that's sort of the way we're approaching it, the, the way we're looking at the deals that, again, we were hoping to close this year um, as we talked to prospective equity and lenders um, and, and how they're, and, but not having a crystal ball, it's, it's a bit of a, um, bit of a guess. <laughs> and Sean, does it make you not competitive to be realistic when you underwrite, if you decided there was be no rent growth for three years and you couldn't make a loan and you have capital that you need to put out, what do you do? Well, I mean, so we're mainly focused on um, kind of build to sell. So, you know, we're, our, our longest loans really are 12 to 18 months. So for, for us, the standpoint is what long term is what happens 12 months from now. Um, and one of the reasons we are a lender, because we were conservative, we, we weren't looking in the environment thinking that the world was rosy. We were looking in the environment saying, 
there's going to be a recession. We're at the end of a 10 year cycle. We don't know what's going to trigger the next recession, but at some point it's going to happen. Um, you know, so we're probably the least optimistic people in, in the room and, and from that standpoint, and we built our business really around that happening. Um, and so now, you know, what are the things that, that, that we're doing? Well, immediately out of this, our, our lending, our, our rates raised 200 basis points, you know, in a day. Um, effectively all loans in, in our pipeline that had to do with, you know, construction or anything that had to do with commercial, office, retail, was pretty much killed. Um, and now really focusing on short-term residential where the market still seems to be strong. And short-term residential, I mean by building and selling condos for sale. So uh, I don't know, I guess there's an interesting question here I'd, I'd like to just ask, we can go back and forth here, but it says, who's inter interested in our solution to improve existing senior homes for those who don't want to move into assisted living? So I guess I'll, I'll sort of phrase the question a little bit different for Lauren, but, but when you think about the problems that we've had in the nursing home and a huge percentage of COVID deaths have come out of the nursing homes and there's a lot of reasons why, but the question is, I think that they're asking is, um, in the single family home or even multi-development, you know, how do you satisfy the growing senior community that can't or won't go into, go into a, a nursing facility? Uh, so we're uh, working on a, a active adult product. It's a 55 and over. Some of them are deed restricted, some aren't, but they're a multifamily offering that has a little bit more of an amenity program, a little bit more referral service, we found great success. Our first project delivered just outside of Philadelphia. Um, and it, it's been a nice in between where people sort of are, it's that transition between a single family home um, and something more in a, you know, kind of a, a denser, more multifamily type format. There's a great sense of community. There's a great sense of um, energy activity. Folks get really engaged. So, um, so that's what we're doing. We haven't gotten fully into the um, independent living space. Um, but we see that as a nice extension as Pizzuto, a very full service property management company that's um, it's in our wheelhouse it, and, it, and again, been very successful. So we're looking to do more of that, um, but staying out of the full, you know, senior um, with medical and meals for now. So there's another question here. I'm going to just phrase it slightly differently. Um, it, when it, it talks about sort of retail and hospitality, and I guess the question I would ask everybody is, so many uh, retail developers made the move from pure retail um, to experiential retail because they felt that retail was oversaturated and people wanted experience. Of course, first thing that happened in the pandemic is any kind of experience or retail is, is over. So when you think about investing in, in whether it's in multifamily uh, supported by retail, um, do you no longer want to have restaurants, coffee shops, the non-credit component of real estate, um, small businesses that maybe your clients, your tenants want, but you really, it's, it's sort of a, not a great investment. And, and how do you look at retail differentiated between, you know, the grocery anchored pharmaceutical that everybody likes because it's credit. And, uh, and then you have the, 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 the beasts, you know, the targets um, and the Walmarts but then you have most of American retail, which is small business, restaurants, coffee shop, barbershops, hairstyles, et cetera. What happens to those businesses um, when, you, when the developer stops taking a risk and will they stop taking a risk, Lauren? Yeah, so it's a great question. Um, we do have a mix. So across Bazuto's larger portfolio, uh, we, prop we have about 2 million square feet of retail um, from a property management perspective. Our retail is actually doing um, pretty good, I think, as it relates, you know, across um, the country. We, we had 60, we're on average about 60% rent collections. Um, but I think it's really, again, because we're multifamily developers and managers, we're always focused on what is the resident experience. And so what can we do to, to, to boost that and to really um, create a place and drive the energy? So with that being said, um, you know, now we are ways, you know, is it, is it more of a credit tenant like a bank? Um, that could go in, which could still, I mean, it's still with, an, with the ATM and, you know, still a bit of a service there. Um, 
but I think long term we're sort of we're we're wanting to have that great mom and pop local restaurant tour cool hip vibe, um, but maybe we're doing it a little bit more strategically where we're putting in TI or some finishes that could easily be um, saved if we went you know if the tenant wasn't going to succeed and we had to turn the space and so can we do these white um, white bot or uh, warm lit shells. Um, where it's very simple, easy to set up from a signage and lighting and um, TI perspective. But then again, we're not sinking a ton of money that has to be um, scraped and you know restarted if the tenant doesn't succeed. So that's one way to be flexible. And then again, also, if we don't have any retail prospects, just trying to activate it with something, maybe it's a fitness component, um, maybe it's a co-working space that we as the, as the building manager are operating ourselves in the short term. Um, but again, long term, I, I think we think retail will be successful. We just have to be a little bit more creative and strategic about it. So let's talk about hotels for a second. I know that nobody, I don't think, here on the panel invests in hotels, but it's an integral component of, of the country in terms of if somebody's going to go try to buy an asset, they're going to go travel and stay in a hotel. Um, obviously, right now, that world is, is partially shut down, although the stock market believes it's coming back faster than probably it is. Um, but I wonder, um, Matthew, when you think about uh, hotels, I know that early in, the, in, in, in this pandemic, when this, the world shut down, um, I know that a number of firms like Blackstone and uh, Starwood went in and bought stock, not debt, stock, in, I think it was extended stay, um, because they believed that you know, if you could drive to the hotel, not get in an elevator, walk into your room, and not pay a lot of money, that that would be the first component of a hotel to come back, as opposed to the Four Seasons and the resort hotels, although Disney has opened up and it'll be interesting to see, notwithstanding the 9,000 cases in Florida yesterday, that hopefully they'll figure out how to do this right. But when you think about hotels, Matthew, um, do you think it's something that, have you invested in it? Would you invest in it? If the price is right, the stress, would you buy it? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, it's, it's something we talk about uh, internally a lot um, when we talk about various asset classes, uh, you know, to, to invest in over the, the short and long term. <clears throat> Obviously, hospitality is, has, you know, with retail has been the worst hit uh, as a result of the pandemic. Um, that should create dislocation and, and we'll probably see some of that uh, work its way through the, the system over the coming six, nine, 12 months. Um, we were actually, we were, we have invested in hospitality uh, indirectly, and, and also uh, we actually were uh, invested in the Baccarat with, uh, with Starwood. So we have had some exposure. We're no, we were no longer in that coming into this. We'd sold that position off uh, a few years back um, and fortunately did very well. But I think that, um, you know, it's, it's about uh, having the right operator, number one, who understands the space. It's a very challenging uh, asset class. Um, but I do think that there will come opportunities uh, you know, that come out of this. And I think it's about assessing them as they come. And obviously they're going to have to be severely discounted uh, to take the risk. I mean, those are going to be, hotels are going to be the asset class that, that take the longest, uh, in my opinion, to come back because uh, it's directly rated, related to travel, uh, both domestically and globally. Um, and about the, the fear factor of, of uh, just, you know, touchless and everything else. And how do you make that experience? And, and as well, I mean, so much of hotel success is based around f &B, you know, F&B operations. Um, which, you know, as well are, have been impacted, you know, restaurants as a result of this. So, you know, I think it's, it, it's going to take some time for those to come back and, and there should be some opportunities to come out of that. You know, we certainly would look at those and, uh, and assess them as they come. So there's a question here that um, I'm going to read, but I don't know that it's exactly correct. It says Goldman Sachs, Blackstone, and Google require double major tech and finance. Uh, Matt, what specifically are you talking about in tech area? Um, I'm surprised to hear that. I, I know a lot of people at Blackstone and Goldman Sachs. Very hard to get a job there. But I mean, I think if you're a great student in, with a finance degree, I can't imagine you won't be able to get a job because you're not a tech expert. But I guess she's asking, Matt, when you talked about tech, what were you referring to? About, oh, for, for the younger audience and, yes. and uh, where they can focus their attention. Yes. Um, I don't know. I, I guess I could probably best explain it through by way of example. You know, there are technologies, right, related to real estate, whether it's 
uh, intercom or door entry or uh, tenant app solutions in the office space, right? You know, if, if, you're a, if you're an office tenant and your building has amenities and it has a restaurant and, you know, boardrooms, conference rooms, uh, you know, the, the experience of being able to mesh those things, th those things uh, seamlessly from a user perspective as a tenant, you know, that's all technology. And so, you know, it's, those all started with, with a question. How can we make life better for whoever the stakeholder is, a landlord, a tenant, um, title companies, wh whoever it is in, in, the, in the business. Um, so I think it, that's what I mean when I say tech is, is really around, I guess, what we would call prop tech, which is um, solving problems uh, or how to improve upon uh, everyday aspects of real estate by way of technology. So there's another question here about co-living, but let me broaden the question by, by asking the following. So co-working was a big part of the economy, big part of the office sector, more in New York than any place else, but Boston has it too. We all know what happened to WeWork. I read, I think yesterday they were thinking of getting out of We Living. Um, and so uh, I'll ask the question, two parts, one to Lauren and one to Sean and, and Matthew. Um, but let me start with co-working. So um, I've always felt that co-working, it, it never could work because of the mis mismatched assets and liabilities. You take a long-term lease and you have a short-term client. And ultimately when the short-term client leaves, you're stuck with the lease and maybe it belongs with an owner who doesn't have to encumber himself with, with that long-term lease. Um, Sean or Matthew, um, what do you think happens to co-working with the densification pro issues that now, you know, Maybe this is the first of many pandemics over the next hundred years, but you know I don't know. But what what's your thought on co-working? Uh, and then I'll ask Lauren about co-living. So uh, I can take part of that. So I think co-working. Just to your point, I mean one of the first things just take backtracking a bit. Um, you know, coming out of Lehman, um, one of the first things I did was debt restructuring and recapitalization. And one of the first you know um, projects we had was recapitalization of effectively, uh, you know, an early version of, of WeWorks, a high end there. And, and just as you said, it was kind of a, a long-term leases and short-term, you know, they, they had long-term leases and they had short-term leases that just kind of went up overnight, um, you know, no different than, than the hotel sector does effectively. And, you know, if you treat it like it's the hotel sector and you understand that and it's not a typical you know, office lease with leases, I think pricing it right, then I think it still works. And so I do think, you know, co-working still works, right? You know, right after that coming out of the crisis, I ended up setting up um, an office for a business and immediately stepped into co-working space because we needed the flexibility to, to grow. Um, and we didn't want to sign immediately a long-term lease. And right now we continue to have, um, you know, we're flex I'm in an outpost, our main office is in New York. Um, we continue to use co-working space. And I think there's many businesses that will. Will it be as large and prevalent as it was before? I, I don't, probably not. Probably, I think that was a, a bit of a bubble and a bit of the way it was done. And I don't think it should be priced the way it was. I mean, it's, it's interesting looking at some of the WeWork space years on is it's beautiful day one, but then you go back into second generation WeWork space, it's not as interesting. And, you know, are you going to spend another 200, 250 bucks a square foot to refresh it every time? So, I mean, it's interesting to see what happens to that space in particular and how quickly prices drop. Yeah. And so I would just add into that. I mean, co-working is an idea. It's a concept. And it wasn't invented by, by WeWork, no matter how much they want to say that it was. I mean, it, you know, HQ, Regis, the, you know, this was, these are all firms that predated uh, WeWork in the co-working space. And, and they did fine, you know, but, but what WeWork did was it, it built a better mousetrap and it, it you know, uh, for lack of a better term, millennialized the co-working space. And it was, you know, largely fueled by, uh, you know, through SoftBank and, and uh, you know, continuing to compound its own investment. And then, you know, a rising tide lifts all boats. And as others saw that they were expanding by way of this, you know, uh, unprecedented investment, other firms got into the space as well. And, and that's when we had, you know, what was uh, basically a saturation of the space. I don't think that co-working goes away long-term. Obviously it's gonna struggle uh, for the foreseeable future, just like, you know, hotel will, for the same re for many of the same reasons. Um, the question is, how do some of these firms weather through that storm? 
Uh, if they're able to or not, it may thin the herd. And then long term, the ones that come out of it, come out of this and survive this, will probably be well positioned to to capitalize on it um, and, and grow stronger as a result. I, I don't think that the the dynamics of the of the office market and the way in which people work, uh, a lot of startups, um, you know, owner operator firms, more so in the last ten years than we ever saw previous to that. I think that that's not going to change coming out of this. Uh, and so that demand will still be there. It's just a matter of who comes out strong on the other side. So you had two questions, Lauren, because I got another one that just came up. Um, uh, talk about co-living, but then also talk about student housing and with universities unsure of A, when they're going to open, but if they do open, they could have another second wave. How do you underwrite student housing today? So I'll give you both questions. Yeah. And, and just on that second one, we are not in the housing market at all. So we've, um, intentionally just sort of steered clear, but it's a great question because I agree there's um, there's a lot of uncertainty there. Um, I can speak to the co-living, which um, we've really been watching. I mean, not that we've gotten to the co-living space. I think there's certainly an opportunity there, much like in co-working, it's, um, it's a small part of the industry, right? I don't think it should be any large percentage of the housing stock. I think it's ideal for folks who are um, getting out of school, like just, you know, wanting to have more of like a roommate type situation, but slightly better amenities, a slightly more elevated experience. But then pretty soon they're wanting to move to, you know, a traditional apartment community. And we're seeing, um, we've been seeing that. So I think that it's, it's great. It's exciting. There's certainly a time and a place for it. I, I just don't think um, it needs, you know, it needs to be done in moderation, much like co-working um, because it's very, the type of renter you're getting is very specific. So um, I'm going to ask one last question because even though I don't know that I missed the queue, I think it's four minutes to three and I know sooner or later they're going to shut us down. So let me ask you all one last question. And that is um, besides the pandemic and, and what the horrific events that happened in Minneapolis and what's going on in the country, which all we all want to correct what's happened. What keeps you up at night in terms of the real estate industry? And I'll start with Sean. I think we really have to be cautious in thinking about defaults within our own portfolio. Um, you know, as much as anybody else says, as, as it kind of, it, it flows downhill to the lender. Um, and so what happens in terms of rental payments or employment, right? So, you know, are there, is there the continual demand for, for housing? Is there continual demand for, for office? Um, and how does that affect our, you know, our underlying portfolio? And then the second to that, what happens in the capital market? So one of the big things that we think about is where does our capital come from? Um, you know, as lenders, we are he heavily dependent on, you know, effectively the, the capital markets. And so where do spreads go and where is risk appetite from the debt markets? I mean, I think everybody watches the equity markets, but really where the action is in terms of determining where pricing is for, for every single real estate guy is on, on the debt capital market. So, you know, that's something we're watching very closely um, whether it's CMBS or securitizations of, of other options, where's that pricing today? And Lauren, what keeps you up at night? So you spoke to it a little bit. I mean, I think um, certainly where is the industry going? We have been behind the times from a technology standpoint. I think certainly from a sustainability standpoint, the, the green building movement took, took hold um, 10 years ago, but I think we can still push that further. And then I would also say from the diversity um, and inclusion standpoint, having a more diverse workforce and, and really showing younger folks, whether they're in high school or college, um, that there are paths for minorities and underrepresented groups because diversity can only make our industry better. Um, and so how do we do that in a really proactive way um, to make change? Matthew, you have the last word. <laughs> I think that it's trying to figure out what the long-term impacts are uh, on the real estate industry and the various asset classes, if any. You know, as I think through it, uh, you know, retail obviously was a very changing uh, asset class coming into this. Certainly is gonna be impacted hard, and, and, uh, but long-term people are gonna shop and spend money and it's just a matter of how they do that. Hotel, we touched on that. It's, uh, you know, people have to travel uh, for that space to work. Uh, corporate travel, other enjoyment, uh, you know, people will do that again one day. Um, maybe it comes back slowly, but it will come back and that'll be fine. Multifamily, people need a roof over their head. 
uh, and, and ultimately, especially if you're working from home more as, as a result of this, you know, we probably want to, uh, you know, continue to pay up for that asset class and maybe get more space. To me, the one question mark is on the office side, right? What is, what is the long-term impact in the office market? Is there a trend, at long-term trend out of the cities? Is there a long-term trend uh, to reduce space because there's going to be a, a hold of a part-time work from home? Is the workforce going to want to come back in full force? To me, that's, that's the critical question from thinking through anything. It's what are the long-term impacts on the office market? You know, maybe it comes back and normalizes. Maybe it looks different, you know, even two, three, four, five years from now. I think that to me is, is one of the questions I, I sit up at night trying to figure out what the long-term impacts are. Well, Gabe, I told you we'd use the whole hour. I'm glad you did. Uh, that's what we had it here for. So I just wanted to say thanks again to everybody. Uh, th this was a really great discussion. Thanks to Sean, to Lauren, and to Matt uh, for your insights this afternoon. And thanks to Jimmy for guiding us through our discussion. I uh, would also like to thank you uh, for joining us today. And as always, a special thanks to our donors for supporting BU and programs like this. Uh, beginning next Wednesday, we have several other programs that may be of interest, um, including pandemic changing retail uh, from bricks and mortar to e-commerce, current insights on the clean energy transition and investment opportunities. We have a program on PR, personal branding, how to increase media exposure for your practice, and social cultural impact of COVID-19 in the Latino Latina community. Uh, so I'll send more details about this email, uh, shortly in an email that I'll follow up with you all. Um, and as always, uh, these and all of our upcoming events are listed on our alumni events calendar, which you can find online at bu.edu slash alumni slash events. Thanks again for joining us today, and we look forward to seeing you at a future BU event. Take care. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye. All right. Thank you. Take care.